long, long, long ago, during the middle of that 95-96 season, during uh, the heart of that remarkable NBA season, uh, when the Bulls were going to go 72-10 and 10 and 87-13, including the playoffs, and win the title, roar to the title, the running of the Bulls, uh, back when many of you who call me an idiot and an imbecile for not realizing that the Warriors are the greatest team of all time, Back when a lot of you guys were still shitting on yourselves, I remember uh, looking at an interview, various interviews, with Will Chamberlain, whether he'd be on ESPN or he might be on the Conan O'Brien show or, or Tonight Show with Jay Leno, just before Will got sick. And he would critique the league. And I didn't like it. I didn't like it. You know, I was a... He was basically saying my era wasn't as great as his. And I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I admit it. But you know what? Even though I didn't like and I grumbled and, you know, to myself when he would say it, I knew that even then at age 15, I knew then that there was truth to what he was saying. He would say that, well, the league today is watered down. That the Bulls were great. But in the context of the teams he played on, he thought that they were overrated. He thought his teams would beat the Bulls. And in some ways, I thought, okay, well, this is a guy who, you know, is stuck in his era. He doesn't want to give anybody in our era any credit. But he did, though. He liked Charles Barkley. He loved Charles Barkley. thought Charles Barkley transcended the game well, and he'd be great in his era and, and this and and, and in the, t the times he was playing. But years have gone on. Years have gone on, and I've tried to research and, and study the history of the game of the NBA. And I've come away with a feeling. And to Bulls fans out there, please don't get mad at me for saying this, because... It'll be like as if I'm a fan of Muhammad Ali, but I recognize something. You know, Muhammad Ali is called the greatest. But even Muhammad Ali said that, no, Sugar Ray Robinson was the greatest. And though I have such an affinity for Muhammad Ali, I do recognize that Sugar Ray Robinson is the pound-for-pound pound greatest fighter of all time. As much as I want to say the Chicago Bulls are the greatest team ever assembled in NBA history, I think the honor goes to the 1966-67 Philadelphia 76ers. And I make this video because a comment I received uh, on Tito Garcia's video about his feeling that the 85-86 Boston Celtics are the greatest team of all time. And I respect Tito Garcia's opinion. But here are my reasons why I think the 66-67 Philadelphia 76ers are the greatest team ever assembled. Not including the Dream Team, of course. Both the 1960 and 92 Dream Teams. Well, for one, let's go with Will Chamberlain. Now, before Will Chamberlain uh, joined the Philadelphia 76ers, he was with the Warriors franchise. Uh, back when they uh, were still in Philadelphia, initially. And then uh, the last year or so he was there, they... Uh, moved to San Francisco. They were called the San Francisco Warriors. And then, eventually, in the early 1970s, I believe they became the Golden State Warriors, which we know them as now. And um, also, the Warriors have two other titles. Uh, just to throw this out there, the inaugural title of the NBA 1946-47 season, there's the Philadelphia Warriors, and also they won a title, I believe, in the, and also that team, their high scorer was Joe Folks. The 55-56 team, I believe that's the team that won the second title in, in the Warriors history. Uh, that Their main scorer was a guy named Neil Johnston, who never gets mentioned by uh, contemporary basketball fans or so-called NBA historians. And then, of course, the third title, the 75-76 season, uh, excuse me, the 74-75 season with Rick Barry. And, of course, the title they won last year, so that's four. But anyway, 
when Wilt was playing with the team, the Warriors, he was putting on just tremendous scoring uh, tangents. But he couldn't beat the Boston Celtics because Boston was just too loaded. And Wilt didn't really play with the type of talent around him that um, could compete with the Boston Celtics. Also, Wilt didn't really trust his teammates, the ones that he did have. I don't really give him, I don't really fault Wilt for that. I mean, because he never really played with a type of team or type of guys that could compete with Boston. And it wasn't for Wilt's individual dominance and brilliance. Those those series with the Boston Celtics would have been a lot clo- a lot more uh, uh, a lot more where I'm trying to use. There would have been a lot less competitive. But then Wilt was traded to the Philadelphia 76ers, and it was here where his coach was Alex Hannum, who was also Wilt's coach earlier in his career with the Warriors. And Alex Hannum uh, convinced Wilt to trust him to his teammates more often. Uh, and really, let's be honest, to mimic the Boston Celtics, to play more of a team concept. And Wilt felt comfortable changing his game. Uh, he became a very... he. I think Wilt had the perfect balance in Philly. Because by the time he was with the Lakers, he was basically totally mimicking Bill Russell as far as just totally focusing on the defense and rebounding aspect of basketball. Whereas with the Sixers, he was still a capable scorer, putting up, I think, 24 points a game that year. But he was a tremendous rebounder, tremendous passing ability for a big man. Uh, that's something that Wilt Chamberlain, you know, for everybody I always say that Wilt is such a selfish guy, for his career, he still averaged 4.4 assists per game which I believe is slightly higher than Bill Russell, who is noted for being more of a team player. Much more of a team player than Will. But I like to throw that out there. Will also is the only center of the league in being assists. But you had Will Chamberlain on that team. You had Luke Jackson, an enforcer, uh, one of the strongest men in the league at the time outside of Will Chamberlain. So you have a powerful front court of 6'7", 250, 260-pound Luke Jackson, who sometimes played back up at center to Wilt. And you have Wilt Chamberlain, the strongest man in NBA history, uh, which has been uh, documented and uh, backed up by numerous Hall of Famers, numerous contemporaries, numerous players, and even Wilt, uh, the, the great Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, can back up that assertion. Then you have on those teams, other great players. Uh, like I said, we had the Hall of Famer and Wilt Chamberlain, the Hall of Fame coach and Alex Hannum, and you had the Hall of Famer and Billy Cunningham, just his second year in the league that time, and he was a Hall of Famer. And, you, you know, he was coming off the bench. That team was so great. Then you had a third Hall of Famer and Hal Greer, the sharpshooter, and he was putting up, I think, something like 22 or 23 points a game that year. So you have three Hall of Fame players and a Hall of Fame coach, which is something that uh, only really could be matched by the Bulls, the 95-96 Bulls. And I'm not sure if Casey, well, yeah, I guess, and also matched by the Boston Celtics. I believe, I believe Casey Jones is a Hall of Fame, I believe. 85-86 Bulls. Now, I don't know what the 2015-16 Warriors will match that because um, Stephen Curry is on his way to the Hall of Fame. I'm going to give Klay Thompson the benefit of the doubt, but it's no shoo-in that he'll be a Hall of Famer. Draymond Green is one of those guys like Dennis Rodman where if he has a lot more team success, you know, then maybe he could perhaps scratch the surface of that opportunity, but I'm not certain about that. Steve Kerr, he could go in, but it will totally be as if, it will, it will only really be for his coaching achievements. He would have to probably, in my opinion, uh, win three titles as a head coach. 
Um, because although he did win five titles as a player, he was totally a role player. I mean, it's not even on Robert Ory level. It's it's he was a totally total role player. And don't let idiots like Brandon Jennings uh, cloud your judgment on that. But because but not just the three Hall of Famers that the Philadelphia 76ers had. They had other players. They had Larry Costello, who many feel should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he's one of those guys who played in the 1950s, 1960s, but he probably should be a Hall of Famer. Um, I believe Bob Cousy said something like, out of all the guys who he played against, uh, and that included Oscar Robertson and Jerry West, no one gave him problems like Larry Costello. Uh as far as defensive prowess is concerned for the other opposing player. And that goes you gives you uh, just what type of player that Larry Costello was on the defensive end. And Larry Costello also went on to coach the 1970-71 Milwaukee Bucks, uh, which were going to go 66-16 and 16 and win the title. And they boasted of uh, Lou Alcindor, soon-to-be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Oscar Robertson, and Bob Dandridge. And uh, many people, like I said, feel that Luke, that uh, uh, Costello, Larry Costello, should be in the Hall of Fame. Other players on that team included Chet Walker while he was in his prime, a great uh, small forward who uh, was a tremendous scorer, uh, could score on the outside, but was known primarily for his slashing ability. And he would... Uh, years later, set the Chicago Bulls record for scoring in a game with 56, which will ultimately be broken by a guy who wore number 23, maybe tw about 25 years later. But this was just an example of the talent that was on this Philadelphia 76ers team. Guys who could score and play defense. Other players on those team on that team included Matt Gukas and Wally Jones. The Philadelphia 76ers team would go on to average 125 points a game during the 1966-67 season. Uh, out of my to my head, the only team that I know that exceeded that would be I can't remember exactly what year it was, but I think it was the 82-83. Denver Nuggets that averaged 126.5 points per game. That was also the same season that the record uh, no actually it was, the, it was the next season but that was pretty much the same team that set the record for most points in the game uh, combined with their opponent the, the uh, Detroit Pistons but it was a December 1983 game so it will be actually the next season but that's the only team off the top of my head that I know averaged more points uh, so they are the second or probably third all time and scoring average. So this is a team that could score, plus, as I say, play good, a tremendous defense. But this is where I really think an argument could be made that this is the greatest team of all time. Now, at the particular time during the 81 game season, the Philadelphia 76ers set a record for most wins at 68 and 13. Later, a few years later, the season was expanded by one more game to 82. Now this is the argument that Will Chamberlain made and I think is a tremendous argument. They managed to win 68 games while the league only had 10 teams. Now do you think that now, now, now in contrast the 85-86 well no, no even before that in contrast, the 71-72 Lakers, which Will Chamberlain was a part of, the team that ultimately went on to break that win, win record was 69-13. and 13. The league had expanded to 17 games. By the 85-86 season, when Boston would go 67-15, the second best record in Celtic history. I've seen some people say it's the best record, but it's not. The best record in Celtic history was set by the 72-73 Boston Celtics who went 68 and 14. They still hold the record for 
the most wins ever for a team not to reach the finals. And that team had uh, the coach of the year in Tom Heinsohn and the MVP in Dave Cowens and boasted John Havlicek, by the way, and JoJo White. But they were uh, eliminated in the, I believe, the Eastern Conference Finals by the eventual champion New York Knicks. Probably, uh, well, I can't say that that's, that, that's their best. But yeah, I think that was their best team. I believe it's a team that won 60 games, equal to the 92-93 Knicks, but I, the, the fact they won the title uh, should uh, separate them from the 92-93 Knicks as the best Knicks team of all time. But anyway, by that time of the Lakers, 72 Lakers, they had uh, expanded 17 games. And by the 85-86 season, when Boston went 67-15, the, the league had expanded to 23 games, uh, 23 teams, excuse me. Did I say games? I meant teams. Now, by the 95-96 Chicago Bulls season, the league had expanded further to 29 teams. And, of course, now there's 30 teams. So, Will Chamberlain's argument is, well, you know, the more teams that's out there, the more diluted the talent is. When Do you really think that the Golden State Warriors would have won 73 games if there was only 10 teams in the league? Meaning that 20 teams right now would not be in the league. Therefore, you would only have the best talent concentrated on 10 teams. So, the Warriors, instead of playing the likes of Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook maybe four times a year and, and, and the Spurs four times a year, they would play them probably nine times a year. And instead of playing their Eastern Conference op opponents twice, they would play them maybe four times, five times. So you would be playing the best more often, let alone the fact that talent-wise individually, the league is diluted. You know, I, I made that assertion uh, with the argument with the MVP uh, unanimous MVP uh, argument that Stephen Curry isn't really going against the most talented field anymore uh, as opposed to how players used to you know, go against top 10 or top 15 MVP balloting which boasted Hall of Famers and All-Stars all the way down. So no, it's very unlikely that the Golden State Warriors would win 73 games if there were only 10 teams in the league. But the Philadelphia 76ers, to me, it also was how they beat their opponents. They were beating the hell out of teams. They, were, they beat the hell out of the Boston Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. And they beat the hell out of the San Francisco Warriors. I guess Wilt exacted some type of revenge on his former team. Uh, I think they beat them four games to two. And this was despite the fact that Rick Burry was having a tremendous series. In one of those games, he scored 55 points, uh, which is still tied, I believe, for the second most points ever scored in a finals game behind Elgin Baylor's 61 and Michael Jordan tied with Michael Jordan 55 against the Phoenix Suns in 1993. But, in my opinion, the Philadelphia 76ers were almost the perfect team. They were the perfect blend of team, of, 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 of team ball, rebounding, toughness, hustle, defense, and scoring prowess. There's no way, in my, in my opinion, that the Golden State Warriors would have beaten the Philadelphia 76ers uh, in a seven-game series, whether you're playing 
into by today's rules or the or the old rules because I don't think that they have an answer for Will Chamberlain. They don't. This is Will Chamberlain at age 30 at his prime with his knowledge of the game and his physical peak. There's no way that they're going to stop Will Chamberlain. There's also, in my opinion, no one to really guard Billy Cunningham coming off the bench. Not really. I guess they could put Draymond Green on him, but then if you put Draymond Green on Billy Cunningham, then who's going to stop Chet Walker? Well, I might say Iguodala. Nah. Chet Walker. They didn't call Chet Walker Chet the Jet for nothing. No. They're not going to stop him. Then you got Luke Jackson. He's bullying everybody down low. Will Chamberlain is just bullying the hell out of everybody. This team would destroy the Golden State Warriors. They would wear them down. But wear them down. And I feel that a guy like Larry Costello would not stop Stephen Curry, but he would be probably able to contain him just enough so that he would probably average more like the t a 25 point range rather than 30 or 30 plus. And as far as Clay Thompson is concerned, how Greer was a capable defender. Uh, from what I read, I don't know whether he was great, but he was capable. And he would give. Uh, Clay Thompson, everything that he would, you know, he would give Clay Thompson everything that Clay would give him back and more on the other end of the court. I think the key to also beating Golden State is to work them on defense, and and the Warriors would do that. I mean, excuse me, the uh, 76ers would work the Golden State Warriors on def on the defensive end. Uh, I think too many teams are sort of myopic on the offensive end in their back courts, and they don't really work they're not as deep as the Golden State Warriors so many times uh, you have guys that are being guarded by players who specialize in playing defense with the Warriors or Stephen Curry gets to rest on the defensive end and get credit for some you know passing lane steals and all of a sudden whoa he loses the main steals well yeah that's all he does wrong I mean, he, he's roaming so much because he's not really guarding any fucking body. That's why he gets so many steals. He doesn't get really worn out on the defensive end. This team will wear them the fuck out. But I will say this at the end of the video. Even though I think that the 66-67 Philadelphia 76ers are the greatest team ever assembled. I also think that the 85-86 Celtics and the 95-96 Bulls will beat the Golden State Warriors. And to be honest with you, not just the 95-96 Bulls, but the 96-97 Bulls will beat them. The 91-92 Bulls will beat them. All right? Um, I think the 83-84 Celtics will beat them, the Tumble of the Warriors. I think the 71-72 Lakers will beat them. I think that the 70, probably the 78, 79 Seattle Supersonics probably would at least give the Golden State Warriors a run for their money. This team is very overrated, man. I'm telling you. 